Oh, yeah, smooth like a Tyrese Maxi step back. It is the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm U Works, Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, Amy Fadul making things happen in front of the camera. Ben Barry doing it behind the scenes, our producer extraordinaire. A pleasure to be talking with you, seeing you guys once again. Wish it was under better circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's spring break. The weather's looking good, but the Sixers are losing uh, a tough one in three road trip, Noah. I know sometimes you feel like, hey, man, I wish I was out there traveling with the team all the time. Do you think you could stomach a one in three West Coast road trip and all the hopping around that goes with it and coming back to East? Do you think you could stomach that? Uh, me me personally? Yeah, yeah, like you, just going through the, the paces of, of, of doing sure. that. Sure, yeah. I, I uh, don't have any trouble stomaching uh, those those kinds of things, but – yeah, I think I imagine it's not fun writing a story after you know all that yeah. goes on afterward. You know, it's. I mean, look, it's it's still been eventful. We've had uh, you know tight games. We've had huge Tyrese Maxi quarters. We've had continued injuries for the Sixers. So um, no, I, I think you know the results yeah ha haven't been the best, but uh, still still some compelling factors for the team. I think, yeah, for them, it's a bummer that it wasn't a two and two trip. The Lakers game definitely super winnable, and they did not shoot very well on on their wide open threes, and you know had a dot of a fourth quarter offensively. Uh, so yeah, there's only only ten regular season games left, though. To the point about the slog of the year, um, yeah. I think everyone can see the finish line, and everyone understands the goal of being a top six seed uh, will require you know probably a good record here down the stretch seven and three might be necessary depending on on what happens around the sixers but for the time being they're on on the outside looking in and uh, that that's not where they want to be it's a little little daunting for us i i don't, don't want to speak for you amy but it gets a little daunting for me waiting for the end of some of those games particularly uh a game like last night where it was so much fun in the first quarter, similar yeah. to like the Phoenix game. Like the first quarter was great. And then all of a sudden it just really faded away toward the end. But I don't want to speak for you. Uh, how, how did those games go for you? Yeah. You, know, you mean at 10 after one o'clock starting your post game <laughs> show talking about a loss? That should have been right. A win. I didn't, I didn't get home to like 2.30. <laughs> not ideal. Uh, yeah. It's disappointing because, you know, you, listen, the, the shows are, are what they are. And to Noah's point, like it's, it's, it's still like great. You can still figure out how ways to like get through it. And obviously, you know, we're not you know, curing, you know, diseases or anything. We're just talking about sports, but yeah, like this is the slag of the season. And it's just, it does have a tendency every year, even when they're winning, have a tendency to drag. And you're just thinking, and it's not, the Sixers are not alone in this. Like all you have to do is look at that Celtics Hawks game from last night and think, I mean, there's something they were up with 30 points and then, and then they end up losing, but it's just, it's one of those if you just kind of trudging on, you're waiting for the finish line. And for the Sixers, they're waiting to get healthy. I feel like there's so much like kind of sitting for them at that finish line that they're just trying to like get there, just trying to, to crawl through all the muck and the mud, hoping that at the end of it, they're going to have a healthy team. And that's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to pick off the wins where they can. They got one. They would have loved two. I thought they had the Lakers game was there for the taking. The Clips game was a gift. And they should have won the Kings game. So like you're hoping two and two, it's one and three. It is what it is. They're just trying to get a couple more wins and somehow, some way, find themselves at the end of this kind of like long journey of 82 games, have a healthier team, and then go into the postseason with that. Yeah, man, the interconnectivity of the season is so weird. Uh, the Pacers beat the Clippers. Yeah. The Sixers play the Clippers next, coming here to the East Coast on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And apparently, just in our discussion beforehand, I haven't looked at the Pacers schedule. They, you're telling me they have a tougher schedule than the Sixers? It's slightly tougher. It's slightly yeah. tougher. Yeah, okay. it's slightly tougher as far as the opponents go. I mean, it's a very similar schedule, but I, was, yeah. I think the Sixers end on a, a little bit of a, an easier note. I think um, Brooklyn is their last game. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, and, they, they they have three, and there's their three straight at home, which help. Yeah. And listen, uh, the play-in is the play-in. Uh, the Sixers are lucky enough that there is a play-in so that they don't right. have to worry about the fact that if Joel Embiid is healthy enough that he has something to come back to. So there is a bit of optimism there. And listen, if you can get the version of Tyrese Maxey that we saw last night in the first quarter 
when MB comes back, and I very much anticipate that we will. I mean, my God, he was on a heater as we talk about like the fun things from last night. Um, and those are the games where I just love hearing like the opposing broadcast because, of course, like we're we're used to it. But you know, Mark Jones, like seeing Maxi going nuts, you know, the Sacramento Kings broadcaster, and hearing his reaction, and you know. The, the audio from the opposing team's broadcast come, picks up some of the sound more from the home. Yeah. So you hear those moans and groans when he's like stepping back from 30. Especially when he had that 30, 30 footer and it put him up, you know, the Tyrese Maxis were 16 and the Kings were 15. That right. was like an audible, like, oh my, this guy. And like, yeah, mm-hmm. that guy. That's exactly what it was. Whew. How much do you enjoy those, Noah? Well, yeah, no, I mean, look, if, if he does that every quarter, he scores 80, 82 points. So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen, but no, it's um, he's, he's shown himself to be capable of scoring explosions, has two 50 point games this season. And it looked like we were on our way to another one. And uh, yeah, it is rare that you see a, a single player outscoring a, another team over whatever, eight or nine minutes. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing that the Sixers just kept successfully getting him switched onto bigger guys, kept targeting Keegan Murray defensively, and yeah. Keegan Murray was getting some buckets of his own. But uh, yes, yeah, Sixers were quite confident that Maxi could attack downhill and be super shifty and explosive against those uh, larger Kings players. And uh, yeah, I think he just he had the game on a string. It felt like so. Yeah, ton, tons of fun when he's cooking. And uh, it does very much feel like something you can count on. Like if we're, if we're looking ahead to the playoffs, that's probably going to happen once or twice a series. <laughs> and that's great for the Sixers. That's the kind of thing that can swing games. Of course, the players around him have to be a little yeah. bit better. They have to make the open threes that are going to be there once, you know, the opposing defense adjusts and starts throwing blitzes at Max- Maxi time after time. Uh, but Tyrese Maxi alone, yes, if he – carries that forward to the postseason. Uh, that would be quite fantastic for the Sixers, and I think give them uh, a great, you know, scoring guard sort of guy that they can count on uh, going, going forward there. Yeah, and to your point, Danny, like when you add Joel and B back into the mix, you, will he get like all those buckets? Probably not, but he'll get some of them, and they'll be able to continue that because they won't be able to, even if they double team him, you're not going to leave Tyrese, you know, you're not going to Joel and dude open. Like, that's why it's such a big difference maker and why you're trying to get to the end of the season and get him healthy and be for a couple of games because you want to see how he can work. These guys need to get back used to playing with him. Like, Tyrese Maxey would have loved to have had Joel and beat in the second half of that game against the Kings because he went one for three in the second half after nine for 13 in the first half. Obviously, they keyed on him. You're going to get a lot more double teams as Noah was just talking about blitzing him. So you have another, you know, very high scoring you know, player out there, it just, it's going to add to good things. You just, you just got to get him back. He meant, Maxi mentioned it. We're waiting for the seven, two big guy to come back. Yeah. Uh, disappointing. Just in all fairness that he goes for 26 in the first half and scores three points in the second half. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just disappointing. Um, injury wise, it would have been a perfect game to have Kelly Oubre. Right. Because, not only has he been playing well and scoring, we talked about the month of March that he's been having, but he is definitely one of those guys that kind of picks up off the energy of like the other players. And Maxie's out here balling out. You can see Ubre hitting the three or getting a put back dunk or doing something that kind of <laughs> contributes to that momentum and the energy that the team was playing with. But, um, but not a lingering issue though, right? Noah, just, uh, uh, like a small, like a Shoulder. twinge or like some type of impingement or something from the spill he took against the Clippers? Or do we know any information there? Seems like, yeah, just just listed as soreness for now. And they, you know, took a look at him in the locker room after he, he crashed to the ground in the Clippers game and they cleared him to return. So I've, I've got to think it's just a woke up, not feeling quite right sort of deal. On the second half of a back-to-back, right? Yeah. Right, and definitely a reason to be a little more cautious there. So, yeah, we shall see. It's a shooting shoulder, so you, you sure hope it uh, feels back to 100% quickly. And he'd been great, I thought, in that Clippers game, despite having having a mere 12 points. Uh, had a career – sorry, season high, six assists, one away from his career high, and uh, was, I think, doing a lot of, yeah, the, the great things we've seen from him thus far in March. 
So absolutely, he uh, he was sorely missed. And uh, I think the Sixers just didn't get enough from the guys they rely on from second as secondary scorers. Tobias Harris, chief among them, started mm. for 13 from the floor, was missing little one-foot shots by the, the third quarter. And uh, Buddy Heald was, was 0 for 6 from three-point range. And then he, too, left uh, late in the fourth with an apparent ankle injury. Uh, Nick Nurse told reporters post game that x-rays were negative. Uh, so we will learn more in the next couple hours about uh, healed status, you know, moving forward and whether whether he's going to be available Wednesday night. But Sixers will take like any healthy players they can get, any shot making they can get. And uh, they were lacking in both those areas last night and definitely uh, big reasons why they squandered, you know, Maxie's amazing start to this game. You mentioned Tobias Harris. Uh, if only he could play his former teams every game. Um, he, he was really, you know, what what a fun, uh, you know, you, you, I don't know, man. It's just those matinee Saturday, Sunday games, um, NBA action, just really, it just is nostalgia for me. So the Sixers, you know, had this game Sunday, Tobias Harris, uh, campaign, uh, Tyrese Maxey just had this great three-headed attack and, they it was just really you could feel the rhythm you know going in between them and then you know coming off the ankle injury maybe there's still some healing or something that's still going on with Tobias the second half of the back to back he's not a spring chicken anymore maybe you know he wasn't quite feeling completely himself you know with the jump shot or what have you come on you. Danny he missed an alley oop I mean he I don't even know that he was even high enough to dunk it when he missed it. I, it, it. It like seemed like he was trying to just drop it in the rim, but I, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what happened. I mean, I really enjoyed I watching him play on Sunday and then on Monday he's like once But isn't again, that the Tobias Harris experience this year? Like, <sighs> against this Kings been. team. Kings team, January, what was it, twelve? They beat him by twenty nine points. Tobias Harris had thirty seven points. Thirty seven against this Kings team. They didn't have Joel Embiid for that game. Obviously, there's other people that did stuff. But then right. you, it, it's it's hard to marry games together with Tobias. He'll have 30, and then he'll have 12. He'll have 29, and then he'll have 8. It's just – that's the that's just how it's – But that's just it's so not indicative of a real pro, like the vet that he is. It's just weird to me that he is has having yeah. so much trouble with the consistency – um, almost feel like maybe there's something going on in his personal life or like, I, I don't, I don't know. It's just um, a weird way for him to go out in his Sixers um, tenure. And I, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just, I don't, I don't know why he's so not dependable at this point, uh, especially this late in the season. I mean, I, I don't know what the point to. Yeah. It's a little bit mystifying. I think this last game felt, very much just like a, a make or miss problem. I, I thought he has been ex like especially aggressive to start the past few games for, since returning from the, the sprained ankle for better and for worse. And in this game, like if you're not able to make a one foot shot, you're, you're not going to be a good player for your team. So he needs, he needs to make, you know, shots in and around the hoop. Um, I thought he was generally reasonable about, okay, I have a matchup I can try to attack here against a smaller guy. I usually am able to make, you know, these little 10 to 12 foot post-up jumpers. They just weren't going in and Sixers uh, are, are going to lose when, when they don't have Joel Embiid and Tobias Harris is five or 15 from the floor. So I, I think if, if you're Nick Nurse, you're the coaching staff, you're trying to just harp on, all right, this is going to happen sometimes. We need you to be steady with the non-scoring areas. We need you to defend hard. Um, and look, I think there's been flashes of him improving in that regard. Like I thought in the Lakers game, he gave a, a strong defensive effort on LeBron James. You saw, I think, some good hustle plays from him defensively during the L.A. weekend. But look, all, all that's going to ring pretty hollow when on the offensive end, uh, he is so, you know, woefully insufficient relative to, to what the Sixers need. And last night in Sacramento was another case of that, albeit on a back-to-back. -back, and those don't exist in the playoffs, but still not not nearly good enough. And um, I don't think you can chalk it up, you know, fully to the back-to-back. -back. It's It's been pretty routine for him um, in the second half of this season that 
uh, those those games are are occurring, and he's uh, he's failed at the the consistency aspect. And uh, yeah, not much time to try to rediscover it here. Frustration setting in with some Sixers fans for sure. Just waiting for Joel Embiid to back. Try to figure this all out. Let's pay some bills and come back and talk about a few more topics and uh, throw some love DJ Wilson's way as well as Paul Reed. Um, but of course, we are brought to you by our title sponsor, Wilmington University. Find your higher education home at Wilmington University, where your academic success is celebrated by a caring community. Explore your opportunities at wilmu.edu. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and so much more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. Back here on the Sixers Talk podcast. And um, before we get to uh, some of the uh, ancillary players, um, Paul Reed was going to go to the Utah Jazz. He had an offer on the table. The Sixers stepped in and said, no, he's ours. We want him back. And he, Noah had a tweet last night highlighting Paul Reed's 1,000th point um, and his durability as well. Can you speak to some of that, Noah, and how he's uh, really had, had a great impact on the front court, particularly because his role and what he's been doing has changed depending on who's healthy and who's not. Yeah, look, he's he's not a flawless player. He hasn't had the perfect season. He hasn't uh, suddenly turned into a, a marksman from three-point range. Like, I think all, all that, you know, should be acknowledged. But, yeah, he's he's been the one sixer to play every single game, and no one else has even gotten close. And, like, I, I think that that deserves a, a bit of credit, right? I mean, he's, he's 72 for 72 and I believe Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris are at, are at 63 games played. And then, of course, many of the other guys they were hoping would be regulars in the lineup are, are way down there in the, the 30s or 40s. So I, I think, yeah, some some dependability in terms of just being available is, is really valuable. And I think Paul Reed often deserves credit for these games where like the Sixers are up against it a little bit and the odds are not in their favor. but he brings a little little something special, brings a little bit of juice. Like I, I thought he was great in that Clippers game uh, when the Sixers were, were playing fantastic defense on James Harden in the fourth quarter. Tyrese Maxey was chipping in there, but Paul Reed, uh, you saw the defensive versatility that this year has included a lot of pretty steady work in, in drop coverage where he's toggling and, you know, those temporary two-on-one sort of situations. And on one play, he just kind of ripped the ball from James Harden yeah. and, tied him up and he was you know very up for that moment and i think uh bring in great energy to the table you know along with a lot of production uh with it so yeah paul reed uh he's he's hit the thousand point mark over 500 of those are this season and to me it's looking like he's capable of a long nba career uh, i think this this has been a sort of pivotal year for him in that regard again one where He's had his ups and downs. He hasn't retained his starting spot. He's had some games where he's been a little shaky with the defensive details. But I think by and large, like he's made a meaningful step forward as far as looking like a guy who's going to stick around in the NBA, doing it his own little unique way. And uh, yeah, the Sixers sure need him to to stay available. And they'll hope a lot of a lot of guys are joining him as every game players uh, when when the postseason rolls around. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, don't want to overlook that they've at least had one guy who's been durable to that extent. Mr. Out the Mud. Yeah, he says he's out the mud now. <laughs> he's all done with it. He's officially got been released from the mud. I mean, listen, there's something to be said for being available. It is the best ability is availability. And he's been there. And I think, you know, he has improved in areas this year. I like that he has a little tenacity as defense turns into offense. I mean, I think maybe him not starting has kind of helped fuel some of these you know, better games for him because they're sticking with it. Uh, he does – it's a lot different a game than Mo Bamba, um, but I think his motor is definitely higher uh, than a lot of the players that you might see out there in a similar situation. Yeah, and um, it was funny. There was a loose ball um, 
in the game. I thought Mo Bamba should have got on the floor, but I think like maybe I was spoiled by seeing Paul Reed do it so much. I was much. like, you've seen Mo Bamba play. <laughs> Mo, Mo's like, I ain't getting all the way down there and getting right back up right away. Like, um, obviously, uh, he's a giant human, so uh, that's not easy for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw uh, Ricky Council the fourth get some some minutes here, probably a little bit earlier than he's typically expected to get them. And DJ Wilson also, Nick Nurse trying to go with some type of change of pace. And uh, it, it's crazy how these opportunities pop up and players like he, he scores ten points in the game. Yep. Like, wait, wait a minute, like who who's this hitting these threes and who? Everybody's who's like this searching double? Google. Who is this? Right. <laughs> Where has he been? Um, yeah, so it's interesting though. Yeah. Guys, they do pop up. Right. The Sixers take yeah. a flyer on a guy, and and here here's DJ Wilson trying to make an impact on the game. Um, ten day contract. What what an what an idea. Like what like you know you just show up and it's like hit or miss yeah you're in let's go you got 10 days to prove and it's 10 calendar days i don't think people sometimes realize that it's not 10 games it's 10 calendar days so whatever the games fall in that you got to hope you can get in prove yourself you know we mentioned obviously kai jones was kai jones has played as much as i have at this point right you don't (laughs) even know what's going on with him but you see wilson comes in you're like oh well that maybe you do have a little something he you know he's been around i remember him a bit at michigan um, you know, looks like he can, he's, he's longer than I, what I recall. He's taller. Mark Jackson was like, what's he six, eight? I'm like, no, this dude's like every bit of six ten, if not a little over and his wingspan, something like seven, two, seven, three. I thought if he can have like a, any kind of offensive presence, I would think he's, it's nice to have that kind of length, certainly out there, um, on the defensive side, but yeah, you never know. These 10 day contracts are right. crazy. You're, you're, all you work for comes down to this, like basically a tryout. Tiny window. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where you may only get two games. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, it's not it's not his first rodeo. Uh, he he got several 10 days uh, with the Toronto Raptors and Nick Nurse mm-hmm. liked what he saw back in the day in the 21 uh, two season, said he thought Wilson was a decent all around player who, you know, had a had a feel for the game. And I think he, he showcased that right away here. Yeah. For Kai Jones, I mean, you know, he, he has a hamstring strain in his second game with the Blue Coats. And the 10 days are up. So, you know, we'll see what's next for him. But it can be uh, a cold league. And like, it wouldn't be shocking if there isn't another opportunity for him in, in quite a while. Um, but, yeah, no, DJ, DJ Wilson, I think, is, is a classic, knows how to play guy. He's 28 years old. He's been killing him in the, in the G League. Uh, he's a good, good big man passer. He's shot around 40% from three-point range this year. And yeah, I don't think he's uh, a sterling rim protector by any means, but the length is a, a fantastic tool. And he, he did block a couple shots last night. And Nick Nurse um, is a real fan of guys taking swings, he says. Like, if you have shot bo- blocking ability, like, go for it. So mm-hmm. I think uh, he most definitely <laughs> likes seeing that from Wilson. But definitely abnormal to have a guy just step in there and say, all right, first touch, boom, pick and pop three, that's in. <laughs> Uh, then he gets a, a catch and shoot three from from the corner, nails that one. Uh, so you know who knows what it means as far as is he able to stick with the stick Sixers? Can he, you know, move this um, forward into to something viable in the NBA? But uh, if you want to make an impression, he did that. Uh, so you know, kudos to kudos to DJ Wilson. Two days down, eight, eight to go for him. Yeah, two days down, eight to go. Uh, the Sixers uh, staring down some big games here down the stretch. Mm-hmm. Um, ten games to go. Noah talked about, you know, six out of ten, seven out of ten, you know, something along those lines. Let's just take them one by one, and we let's start with this Clippers game Wednesday. There's no way – Harden pulls a Ben Simmons or something like that, right? It has like a mystery. It just doesn't show up. Or, you know, just he's on the, he's not, doesn't suit up or just well, sits on the bench. The report was, the report was that when by the time Ty Lu got into the locker room after the loss to the, the Sixers on Sunday, he had already left. Like he just didn't want any part of it. I we are well imagine, familiar with that. We are familiar yeah, I, with that. I can't that. imagine that went over real well with his teammates. A guy like Kawhi, who's an absolute robot machine basketball like that's all I do I can't imagine that went over well with him or Paul George but I guess you know you take the good with the bad I I think he'll play I'm interested to see how he does because he's that Clips team is leaking oil they just lost to the Pacers and you mentioned it they hadn't been on a big tear 
they won what two in a row before they faced the Sixers, but that was against the Trailblazers. So uh, I think he, I think he plays. It's feast or famine with that guy. He's either he's either all in or he's out. He's very moody. He's a very moody fellow. That James Harden. No, before beard. you comment, I really wish that we could have seen when you did the Kawhi impression. If we could have seen the rest of your body, it was like a robot going on. Where you like was there? <laughs> That's it. That's, that it works though. It works because we know That's, exactly that what that you. Guy is. I don't know that he finds joy in anything. We've seen him smile like twice in his life. But Kawhi is an absolute machine, and he can play on my team any day of the week. Do you have an impression of his laugh? Do you have that? No. <laughs> Stop that. that is, it's not bad, right? It's a solid. Yeah. Yeah. A little Kermit the Frogish, I guess. Yeah, no, or Evan Turner. Mm -hmm. No, he's one of a kind. Um, yeah, with with James Harden. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone covering that game was was thrilled that he dipped out of there, but. He'll be making the return to Philly, and I, I've got to think he's been told you need to stick around and actually address some of these questions about what went wrong and what have you. Um, I do remember it surprised a lot of people last uh, season, I guess, when, when he was back in Brooklyn, how candid he was about his Nets tenure, basically saying, like, I was right. This this is a mess, and I don't have any regrets about leaving here. and. Mm -hmm. I don't think the organization had stability and there were a lot of bad things going on behind the scenes. Like that was, that was a little bit startling that uh, he didn't just give, you know, boilerplate answers, didn't have any diplomacy. He was uh, very, very honest about uh, his time with time in Brooklyn and, and feeling he'd made the right choice to opt to leave. Now he's uh, off to another team and, and been there for a few months Let's see what he has to say about, about the time in Philly. But, yeah, as far as on the court, Tyrese Maxey was decisively the better player in the fourth quarter. And it was, it was fun to see them go head-to-head -head a little bit. For most of the game, it wasn't a you know, true sort of duel. But, man, like when, when they went out at each other, Maxey got some stops on James Harden and mm -hmm. had one or two blow-bys on him, hit a jumper or two over him. Uh, he was... I think uh, very excited about the prospect of cooking this guy who'd you know been a mentor to him and uh, really close with with Maxi for you know his time in Philadelphia. So yeah, um, who knows exactly what we're going to get from James Harden? I agree, you can't you can't pencil in uh, mm -hmm. exactly what he's going to give you as far as the stat sheet, but um, I think if we do get a Maxi versus Harden duel, in all likelihood, um, it'll it'll be really cool to watch and. Uh, the fans will let their ire toward James Harden be known every millisecond that he touches the ball. Oh, great! Um, so yeah, if he if he is going to suit up, uh, I think he he knows that's that's going to be part of the deal. Yeah, I think he'll get the Simmons treatment in that. As far as like every time he touches the ball, you just you don't wrong our our fans. We do not like that. I, I thought they would boo Jonathan Kaminga like that when he came oh, to Philly. We fell on Embiid's leg, but he didn't. Like, they didn't even boo him. Dive. People have to, I mean, I don't know that people are going to play. I mean, yes, they probably should have because that's kind of like our cup of tea. But they're definitely, the fact that, I mean, they're going to just, Harden is going to hear it. But the thing is, I worry for a guy like James Harden, he hears the boos and it like unlocks some kind of oh superpower for him. Like yeah, he turns not... and puts, you know, you know, all of a sudden like the mask turns around. And he's like, oh, now I really enjoy basketball again. And all of a sudden, you know, he does whatever. The Defensively, Noah brought up a good point. Tyrese Maxey should be able to blow by him. James Harden's never been good at defense. He's not interested in it. It's not something he does. Now, obviously, the latter stage of his career, he definitely doesn't like to do it. So that's something they should exploit. The thing with him, you got to limit, make sure he doesn't, you know, go crazy. His numbers are down just because his usage is down. Um, I think that if you look at the way the usage correlates, it's probably on par with what it would have been, you know, the numbers wise. You know, I think he's like, what, like eight assists? Uh, and may, maybe like four or five less points, but still up there. I mean, still a guy that's absolutely capable of, you know, dropping 30 on you if, if you don't watch it. And we all know about Paul George and, and of course, the robot Kobe. But he, here's my thing. Okay, he's definitely going to get booed. And yeah. that definitely has something to do with the whole Daryl Morey is a liar stuff. I'll never play there again. And all the whole way, the juxtaposition, like everything just went from, something that maybe they could have built on to him like i'm, I'm out of here type of thing but th this can't be the worst of the places that he's been like well, that's the thing you know what i'm saying this man, yeah the, the nets i think and i think 
I'll give him a little bit of credit. Clearly the net situation was kind of messed up and you saw how that all came to be. And, you know, they ended up blowing it up. That, I think that net situation was probably the worst of them. It, it, it was so puzzling when people thought like, why is he going to go back to Houston? And then you, who knows what motivates this guy? Who knows what he thinks is good and what's bad? Because I think some people might think those situations were, were better or worse, but yeah, I don't think it's probably, listen, you can't tell Philadelphians that this is the worst place because it wasn't, but <laughs> you can tell James Harden that and he'll probably say that it was. And he had such a great relationship with Daryl Morey. And I don't know if it's booing because of the Morey is a liar thing so much as that, that he just want, he didn't even take the time to try to figure out how he could have stayed. In his mind, it was like, this is what you have to do for me because I'm so amazing and you didn't do it for me. So I'm out. That's kind of the vibe I got. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as, as far as what motivated him, I think Philadelphia is, is not his hometown and they don't have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George on their team. Yeah. And yeah. also all parties have made it clear that there was not a willingness to extend James Harden for many years at, at the maximum amount of dollars. So I, I think somewhat simple in that regard, but no, I do agree. He can, he can be uh, rather enigmatic and a little, yeah, a little ornery for sure uh, with just like the, the vibe he gives across as a, as a superstar. So yeah, I, I think he didn't do much to endear himself to, to Sixers fans, like with the clunkers in the playoffs last year. And I think they're going to remember those a lot more than the you know magnificent 40 point games yeah. and the leading the league in assists or whatever it's like what he you know, taught Tyrese Maxey yeah and no, that's like, the thing. Yeah. you know what I'm saying he did good stuff he single-handedly won probably two games in the playoffs but you think about game six and game seven and you're like I don't care about what he did in games two and three it doesn't matter to me right I think he he came to Philadelphia with certain aspects of his reputation that were pretty entrenched, you know, playoff disappointments being one of them. And uh, I think, you know, two Sixers fans, he is still, he's still a playoff failure. That's still how they see him. And yeah, I think the, you know, balanced, nuanced uh, sort of big picture that, you know, we might, might be trying to capture is not, not going to be on the minds of people who are letting those boos fly tomorrow night. And I do think Harden, to his credit, will understand that. He'll probably have some fun with it. Yeah. And uh, I think he, whether he'll say it or not, will be a little a little more motivated to to give his best self. He's had some great games in Philadelphia back in his, uh, even his Thunder days and certainly his Rockets days. He's lit the Sixers up for, you know, 40 plus points. So uh, I think he believes he's capable of doing the same again. But he's also, as we know, been been huge on showing off all his skill as a facilitator. And if the Sixers get the ball out of his hands, he'll he'll happily give it to uh, Paul George and, and Kawhi Leonard and and trust them to uh, to hit shots tomorrow night. But yeah, it's it's a game that both teams I think should be a bit fired up for, even beyond the whole Harden's return part of it. Uh, Clippers don't want to kind of keep you know declining in their level of play. They want to get the best seed possible. And uh, yeah, the Sixers want to somehow be a top six team. If they beat the Clippers twice in three games, that would would go a long way to making it happen. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't beaten any other teams since he contested Kawhi Leonard's three point shot in that game against Portland. So that must have gone over saying. like a lead balloon with Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> There's no way that man thought that was funny or appropriate <laughs> or anything. He James Harden thought it was probably hilarious. And right. I, I would, if Kawhi, like, would, would, if he could talk like a normal human <laughs> instead of like a robot, he probably would have had choice words. But of course, he probably did, does not compute and he just shut down in the corner and, you know, wait for himself to recharge or something. But that, I can't imagine that went over very well with Kawhi. Hey, um, Amy, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, I've enjoyed yes, listening to you. Hit another three. Is that what you're going to mention? No, so I'm not going to. I will not do that to you. No. Um, yeah, no, 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 he's still hitting threes. Uh, Amy still reeling from her Kentucky Wildcats losing in a ridiculous fashion. The biggest underdog ever. Um, not the well, biggest not underdog big ever. ever. But... UMBC beat UVA right, as a 16 right. and a 1. But you're right. Well, it was ridiculous. They were minus 650. So if you put a bet on Oakland to, to beat Kentucky, then it was a happy day for you. But um, I was going to do what I was going to say was that we've been hearing you on 97.5, the fanatic. I've enjoyed listening. Thank um, you. It, 
And uh, I want to say you do a great job. Uh, is that going to be something that we can look forward to more? It is. I will be on best uh, show ever today, uh, three o'clock, depending on when you listen to this podcast. So it might have already passed. Um, and then hopefully in the, the coming weeks, I will be making regular guest appearances across the uh, the shows on 97.5, hopefully, you know, leading to, to more stuff and down the future. But it's uh, something, uh, you know, they were a great partner. Obviously, with 97.5, we do a lot with them, you know, simulcasting the, the best show ever uh, with Ricky and Tyrone. And then, of course, um, just the natural Jim partnership of yeah. Jim Scordo and, you know, with them broadcasting the Sixers, it was a, a good fit. So I've, I've been, you know, I did the first show of Bob Cooney on Monday. Bob and I go way back. I've known Bob my entire time here uh, back when um, he would be on Daily News Live and I would fill in, obviously, hosting that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's something that uh, I will be doing more of um in the future and that i look forward to very much because you know i like to talk so <laughs> that's all it is is chit chat from it's show. crazy some people might not even know bob cooney the writer they might just know him as like they a radio really guy yeah him. yeah which is kind of crazy to think about but he was the sixers guy for the longest time he traveled yeah. with the team and uh he was he's been there a long time he's been in the business for 30 plus years here in philadelphia good guy so i'll be on like i said with ricky and tyrone and then next week i'll be on with uh kincaid and sound Junis in the morning as well, just to kind of introduce me across the board um, to the different 97.5 listening type of groups. Um, and then, you know, you may, I'm, you know me, I'm a, I'm a plug and play type of lady. I was about to say, my lady, you, she can go wherever. from morning, you're, afternoon. You're you're right. Right. <laughs> with Connor, like a couple, like two weeks ago, I was on at 2 a.m. with night. the Sixers, yeah. right. No worries. 2 a.m. last night, me and Jimmy Lynham is still hanging out. No, no big deal. That's us. You know how we roll. Of course, got to show some love to my guy, Noah Levick. Uh, what's happening on the website, sir, and uh, what can we look forward to there? Uh, yeah, we, we've had coverage of uh, of it all through the road trip. Um, yes. Finally, Sixers are back home, so um, we'll have, have wall-to-wall coverage of that, Sixers versus James Harden. Um, and, yeah, so, you know, some some things percolating, but uh, – that is is next on the docket and is is the focus for for now. So so looking forward to uh, to that matchup. Hey, we're looking forward to speaking with you again on Thursday. Uh, we will see you again on the Sixer Talk podcast after this Clippers game. I'm sure it will be a frenzy, and I think that is also a 97.5 the Fanatic knockout game. Not that that is connected to me in any type way or form, but there will be a lot of energy in the arena yeah. for sure. Um, Hope so. Uh, be sure to check out uh, NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com and our channels, NBC Sports Philadelphia, NBC Sports Philadelphia Plus, for all of the goings on. For Amy Fadul and Noah Levick and Ben Barry, I'm Danny Pomels. Thanks for listening to the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm, you works. We'll see you next time.